Okay, I'm going to keep these comments pretty short to a, to a minimum, really. Give two or more time to introduce the conference. Um, but what I want to start with, just to kind of get people thinking, is how we can take these three themes of prediction, cultural evolution, and creativity and kind of meld them together. So I'm going to focus on the interconnections um, rather than each of the specific topics, which you're going to be hearing lots more about in the course of this conference. And the first comment I'd like to make is just that I think music as a, as a tool for studying human cognition, as a, as a tool in cognitive science, provides an extraordinarily useful and practical way of studying all of these themes. Um, so much of our work in, in cognitive science has been based either on language or on visual stimuli that I think music provides this beautiful kind of in-between. So it's more abstract and you know, less, less semantically uh, grounded than is language, but at the same time, it's a very much a, a product of the human mind. Um, it has a written system, at least for Western music. We can write it down, we can, we can record it and translate it, so it's, it's quite useful for creating stimuli, etc. It also has a very rich body of theory, so we can really avail ourselves of hundreds of years of hard work, mostly by musicians and more recently by theorists of trying to understand what's really going on. So like linguistics, there's a, a very elaborate and uh, complex theory behind it. So I think all of these things combine to make music uh, uh, wonderful. And, you know, I think this is appreciated, particularly in the cognitive neuroscience of music. But I think we still have a ways to go as music researchers in convincing the broader cognitive community how, how, how powerful this is. So I want to offer a way of trying to pull these three theme, conference themes together, prediction, cultural evolution, and creativity, in the context of music. Well, I'm going to start with an idea that my colleagues and I, um, it's really an old idea, this is not something new, we gave it a new name, um, the aesthetic trajectory. So I think art in general, aesthetic experience in general, is, uh, goes through a kind of often multiple times, but through a sort of three-stage process. And some, maybe the simplest forms of aesthetic experience, like jokes, only do it once. But in a particular music piece, it, these, this, you'll run through this aesthetic trajectory multiple times. Um, and the argument that we made in the, in the paper that's down there, that was me and a musician, Eric Nicholas, and Antje von Grevenitz, who's an uh, art historian, is that this Aesthetic trajectory is most clear in music, but it actually also typifies uh, any kind of aesthetic experience, for example, the static visual arts, so looking at architecture, paintings, sculpture. And the three stages of this aesthetic trajectory are, um, first and most obvious, a sort of recognition. So you, some, some kind of schema, you get enough of some sort of schema or pattern that you can say, uh, okay, I know where we are. So this might be as simple as a, as a tonic chord or a, maybe a one to four or five uh, progression in music. Um, in a painting, it could be something like, oh, it could be as simple as saying, oh, it's a painting. It's a piece of canvas in a frame on a wall. Or it could be, the, uh, this is a painting of lily pads or of a person with a human face. But typically that's not enough. So that recognition is obviously part of the predictive uh, processing. It's one of the themes of this conference. So in order to recognize something, you, well, once you've recognized something, of course what you're going to do is predict how it will continue. So that's, that's the most obvious stage. It's like, hello, okay, I, I, I kind of know what this is. I know what key we're in. I know, this is a, I know what lily pads look like. Um, and then what makes it Aesthetic, the first stage, is some sort of surprise, something that gets you, that makes you go, ah, but this is not quite what I predicted. And I think this is the crucial, the crucial stage. Um, so, for example, in well, so we have this recognition, then we have some kind of surprise that gets your cognitive system, maybe unconsciously, thinking, oh, uh, what, what's going on here? Um, and that's kind of the setup. So. You know, I, I think jokes are a nice example. So basically you have some kind of set up, a guy walks into a bar, or you know, a rabbi and a priest are trapped on a desert island, whatever. You set up some little scenario, and then you set up a, a, a question or a surprise. Um, and then the crucial point where you actually get the aesthetic reaction, where you actually go, ah, and you like it, and you, you get a, a, a nice pleasant rush of dopamine, is the third stage, namely the resolution, where somehow, 
that surprise is resolved in a way that makes sense, that makes sense in the original context of recognition. So as I said, I think in, in music, this will happen multiple times. Uh, this is not something that just happens once, except in the simplest forms, like a, a simple joke or something. I think this typifies all of the art forms, but I think in music, it's beautifully illustrated because of the temporal nature, because this stretches out in time, and because, for example, in a written score, we can really say right here is where that surprise happens. Right at this point, this note doesn't fit in the pre-existing key, or this chord is surprising given the schema that I was expecting. So it, you can really pinpoint that, and that's of course super useful for things like ERP. Um, and then the resolution, you know, to effectively resolve, we somehow have to either change key and find a new tonic, or come back to maybe through some long voyage with multiple aesthetic trajectories, come back to our tonic key. Um, and then we get this feeling of satisfaction. Of, and, and I think the reason this is so aesthetically pleasing is that our brains are, we, we are curious, we, but we are also habitual. So in, in a way, this process of the aesthetic trajectory exercises both, it, it gets our curiosity going, it gets a little bit of surprise, which will probably make a little dopamine burst, but then the resolution is what makes it um, powerful, but what makes it aesthetic. And so a, a bad joke is one where there is no resolution. It could just, this is like little kid jokes at, a, at age four or something. They just say something silly. It's just a non sequitur and it doesn't resolve. Okay. So I, I think, you know, this, of course, this, this basic idea, this is a, it, 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 well, Leonard Meyer, I think David Huron has in his book, Sweet Anticipation, really illustrates the, 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 the ideas of this very beautifully. And uh, really all we've done is give it this name. I, I, I still like, I think, the aesthetic trajectory. The idea that aesthetics is essentially a mental movement, even for static art forms, like looking at a painting, I think is, is the crucial idea here. So that's why I like that word trajectory. Okay, so now, next question is, where does this recognition come from? And the answer, of course, is that it comes from our experience. And in the arts, particularly in music, it comes from our experience with previous artworks. Um, so if, if you don't know, if it's the first time you've ever listened to Gamelan, or let's say you're, you've been living somewhere where it's the first time you ever hear a 1-4-5 progression in Western music or in pop music, um, there will be no schema there. You, you might recognize that there are pitches. You might say, well, this is kind of musical, but I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. And then, of course, without that first stage of recognition, you can't even get this aesthetic trajectory going. That's, that's where we are when we're babes in the woods and we come in and we experience a new form of music for the first time. We don't really, we can't even get into the recognition stage initially. Music is great for this again because of the repetition. So even if we've never heard gamelan before, it, it repeats enough times that we're like, yeah, okay, I, rec I, I recognize that sequence of, of hits or those, those particular bells and gongs that combine in a way that I recognize. But then again, we've already set up the grounds for some kind of surprise, for some kind of change. So, and I think one of the, uh, the other beautiful things about music is that, like language, musics around the world follow certain very basic principles. So I think there's a human musicality, which we all share in common around the world, but that's been implemented in different musical styles in totally different ways. Well, not totally, but in very different ways. And um, that's what makes, I think, music so rich. Even if you know the music of your culture very well, it, you often don't have to go very far to find a new musical style, a new way of setting up a schema um, that's, that's quite foreign. So that, that brings us, so where do these come from? Well, of course, where they come from is cultural evolution. These things didn't, weren't just sort of invented out of whole cloth by some brilliant creator. They've been amalgamating over long periods of time and in some way, well, let's just say they've changed, they've mutated, and some of those mutations are um, favored and end up going on in, in history. So, you know, things like the idea of a tonic, that goes back in, in Western music, that goes back into the Middle Ages, if not before. Um, things like a tonic, tonic subdominant, dominant, um, the, these basic chordal notions also are already there, richly there in, in late music, in chant, etc. Um, 
but they're quite different in other forms of music. And there are forms of music where harmonic progressions of that form aren't even really the main point. So for example, in a lot of Sub-Saharan African music, it's much more about rhythmic complexity and the, the interesting aesthetic meat is in the rhythmic domain rather than in the harmonic domain. And again, that will have evolved. We know that it evolved over many thousands of years in, because we can see that in different branches of Africa, there's similarity to, you see the Darwinian pattern of descent with modification. So I was gonna say music progresses or improves, but I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's actually, I, I think it's interesting to ask to what extent is music or other aesthetic domains like technology. So we, we can look at, for example, fire making or canoes or ways of making rope or ways of making stone tools. We have a rich history of you know, a million years of stone tool making and we can see that these tools got more and more complex and also more and more effective as humans progressed, as we went from Australopithecines basically making some flakes of stone to these ridiculously gorgeous and difficult to make uh, hand axes that Homo erectus and and early hominids were making. So I think it's, it's quite clear that in the domain of canoes or tools, there is an actual improvement that, that culture can improve over time. But I think when we come to the aesthetics, the, the aesthetic domains, particularly in music, um, it's much less clear that there is a, some sort of steady progression because there's no external force. There's no cutting through ropes or meat or, or, or going faster in a canoe. There's no external practical physical constraints on how the aesthetic domain might progress as, as evolution, as cultural evolution occurs. Now, so what is the selective force? Well, obviously the selective force is the human ear. So if we think from the production point of view, a singer sings and human ears perceive that, or the human mind perceives that, and likes it or doesn't like it, remembers some things, forgets others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you, if we adopt uh, Richard Dawkins' term meme, which I've I, I've always liked the term meme. I, I'm a, I'm a meme. Um, I think we should rescue the word meme and memetics. And this is a little commentary that Marisa Hirschel and I just uh, published. I'm not sure it's out yet, but it will soon be published in Current Biology, accompanying Pat Savage's nice new paper on cultural evolution and melodies in Japanese and uh, British, British American melodies. And what we argued in this little commentary is that in a way music is a, a, almost a pure form of aesthetic cultural evolution in the sense that the only constraints or nearly only constraints are what the human mind can produce and then what human listeners um, remember and reproduce. And there's not any clear, practical, um, it, it, it doesn't have to do anything more than delight or, or socially bind or, or, you know, music does a lot of things, but it doesn't have to do more than that. It doesn't have to satisfy any external physical constraints the way a canoe or a tool or even language, which still ultimately has to do its semantic job and refer to things out there in the world or thoughts in our head. Music doesn't really have to do that. So I think in a way, music is, a more free, is more free to explore the mimetic domain. And the corollary of that is that actually music is perhaps one of the richest ways to really look inside the mind over cultural time, because we're really looking purely at results of mind. Okay, and I know, yes, we use our fingers and we play instruments, and instruments have improved. Those are tools for making music. Those are... So this isn't a pure thing. What we've tried to illustrate in this figure is a kind of continuum from more constrained to, or let's say more physically or externally constrained to more cognitively and, um, well, more mentally constrained and less physically constrained in, the, in the, these kinds of uh, continua that are supposed to be indicated by the gray bars here. So coming back to the conference themes, I think, again, music and cultural evolution provides this wonderful way. So we can see cultural evolution at work in this wonderful paper that Pat Savage has just produced. We can see really how melodies change over time. And I think those methods have a lot of legs. We're going to see a lot more from that kind of method. Um, but also, this gives us some insights into what the processes are 
that create the schemas that our predictive mind is going to make use of in, 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 in the aesthetic trajectory. Okay? And this also helps to kind of get over this boring nature-nurture controversy. And of course, music is both nature and nurture. It's nature via nurture, or nurture via nature. It has, the, of course, there are biological components that make humans different from most other species that underlie music. But at the same time, cultures vary incredibly and beautifully in the ways they make use of these fundamental biological, the, the fundamental kind of building blocks of human musicality. Okay, so turning to the last and um, I think in a way most exciting and difficult domain is creativity. So, and this is now still on the, tra the, the aesthetic trajectory, how do you get this novelty and, and resolution aspects? So we've got our schemas, we can see how those schemas might develop over historical time through a kind of process of a mimetic evolution process. But w what about the novelty? Where does that come from? Um, and I think any, I, I, I play jazz not very well, but I like to improvise. And I think the, the, there's kind of two answers. One is that you hear somebody doing something and it's relatively novel and you, put, you, you, you pull that into your new usage, but maybe in a new context. So that's a kind of reuse of novelty. But occasionally truly novel things come along and it could just be I'm playing a melody and my finger slips. And I think, oh, that actually sounds kind of better than what I was going to play. So, so there can be a random process where you make mistakes, but you, you like them and you preserve them. And, you know, but there also can be really exploring and saying, okay, I want to do something new here. I've played this progression too many times. I, I, want, to, I want to come up with something different. And you experiment until you find something good. So it's a little mimetic process inside your own, inside the composer or improviser's head. Now, of course, what's cool about this is that over the process of cultural evolution, something that was novel can become standard, and that provides the building block. And there, there is where I think we can say there's a, 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 prog a kind of progress, or certainly a change with progression in, in music. So, for example, if you, I, I've got King Oliver here, one of the great early jazz uh, ensembles, and these guys were improvising their butts off, but basically they were playing pretty standard not very surprising Western harmonic progressions, but as jazz progressed and until the present time where almost anything goes in free jazz, there was a steady accumulation of things like, um, you know, sub dominant substitutions, you know, the, the uh, two, five, one pattern became more and more extended, uh, the use of, of ninths and elevenths and higher chords over the sevenths became um, more and more common. And so I think in a, in a field like jazz, we, we can really see uh, stages in which the harmonic complexity increased and then sort of areas of stasis and then new, new innovations. Yeah, modal jazz, uh, Miles Davis and modal jazz in the, in the 60s would be another example of this. So again, we, we have this tension between setting up schematics and creating novelty. And we can't just just play anything. If you have your cat walk across the piano, no one's going to get, well, it, it would be very rare to get a pleasing aesthetic experience from that. On the other hand, sometimes the cat walking across the piano might be just the thing that sparks that little bit of novelty. That's all we really need to engage our aesthetic trajectory. Okay, um, that's all I have to say. I, I think it's a, I'm, I'm sorry I have to do this. Uh, this is a canned thing, so I can't answer your questions afterwards. I'm on US time and I'm actually kind of on, on vacation in Sanibel, Florida. Um, so, but I wish you all the best. I'll probably dial in for some of the later, uh, later talks in this conference and I look forward to, and I wish you all an exciting and thought-provoking conference. Goodbye. Thank you.